chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Fume. Cold turkey may be great on sandwiches. Actually, if I don't see a turkey again for a while, I'll be good. But as far as for bad habit breaking, there's a better way. And no, we're not talking about making wishes on the chest bone of the turkey you ate last week, nor hypnosis from your new age neighbor. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume, and they look at the problem in a different way. Stopping is something that we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from not-so-great habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code HORROR to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com and use code HORROR to save an additional 10% off your order today. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. In particular, tonight's episode includes scenes involving sexual assault and suicide. Listener discretion is advised. Well, hello there, my friends. I'm Eric Peabody, and you've found your way back to Horror Hill. If you're just tuning in, you should know that tonight's episode is the middle portion of a three-part arc, covering the story The Eyes of Amityville by Mark Rowland. I'll be providing a brief synopsis before we jump in, but if you haven't heard the beginning of this tale, I'd recommend listening to the prior episode before continuing with this one. Mark Rowland is both the author and main character of this story. In last week's episode, we learned a lot about Mark. How he's a horror writer that has been experiencing writer's block. How he has a complicated relationship with his wife, Jess, but has two loving children in Jack and Emily. We also learned that Mark has been fighting his writer's block by collecting murderabilia real-life items that were connected to real-life murders. He's actually just managed to find his white whale, the two eye windows from a very infamous house in Amityville, New York. Ever since obtaining them, Mark has been feeling a little ragged, a little unlike himself, and a little untethered. In fact, we ended last week's episode as Mark was transported to the actual house in Amityville, to a night of violence in 1974, and how he watched through his own eyes as he committed a string of murders. Tonight, we continue Mark's tale as the eyes of Amityville strengthen their hold on him. Joining us tonight will be Danielle Hewitt, who voices several characters in this story. And listeners, before we jump in, I should let you know that there are a few rough scenes in this story. 
gird yourself, and let's get started. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now, from author Mark Rowland, I give you The Eyes of Amityville, Part 2. Chapter 6 Hunter Although the vision I had experienced was more than a frightening one, there was still a part of me that was curious for experimentation. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that if I could keep cognizant of the situation, maybe I could put such a vision to work for me. The imaginings weren't real and never would be, although there was obviously some truth to be found in them. Keeping myself grounded would be the key. And who knew? Maybe I could find out more about the Amityville conundrum itself. One thing was for sure. The energies that those windows carried were nothing to be taken lightly. So, under the ruse of the writing timetable I had to keep, I made daily trips to my room to see what secrets I could unearth and what debaucheries could be unlocked. Most often, nothing would happen at all. I would sit in my chair, look out the windows, and contemplate. Sometimes I would put a few of my thoughts down on the screen, sometimes not. But every once in a while, it would happen, and each time was different than the last. The variable was always the victim. At times it would be Jess, at other times it would be the children, and on certain occasions it would be some unrelated figure from my past. The locale always remained the same, however, as well as the murder weapon. And the lapse of time? Always. I could lose an entire day in there easily, with nothing to show for it. Yet, I continued... The pull became stronger with each new day, until there was nothing I would rather do than escape the reality I was currently occupying. On one certain late summer's afternoon, as I was peering out onto the street, waiting for my muse to visit me, someone entirely new entered the frame. It was not uncommon to see a jogger or dog walker pass by, every hour on the hour, especially during nice weather. But this person left quite an impression on me. She was absolutely gorgeous. Well-endowed, toned, blonde hair, and quite possibly the nicest ass I have ever seen. I watched each cheek bounce, in slow motion it seemed, as she ran past the house. A true masterpiece. From the first moment I saw her, I wanted and needed her to be mine. So, take her. But I did not know how. Fuck her. My own wife hadn't given me sex in a while, and whenever we did it, it was not exactly the most passionate thing in the world. Just another one of Jess's tasks, I suppose, like cleaning the floors or cooking a meal. I made it a point to return to the windows around the same time every day, just so I could get a glimpse of this woman. Do it, you pussy. Eat her all up, just like the pervert you are. I began to fantasize, and sometimes, as the trances continued, this woman also adopted the role of the victim, always face down, with a gunshot wound to her back, just like all the rest. After about a week or so of incessantly thinking about this nameless woman, I did decide to make a move. I knew that I shouldn't, but by this point my suffering libido was doing the talking for me. I figured I would follow her, just to see where she lived, so I could maybe set up a chance meeting of sorts at a later date. You mean, stalk her? You really are a sicko, Mark. No wonder why Jess hates your fucking guts. 
Jess would probably thank me. I would no longer need to bother her with my physical wants whatsoever. It was a normal run-of-the-mill Wednesday when I put my plan into motion. I told Jess and the kids I was going out to run a few errands, which I was actually going to do anyways. I hopped in the Subaru, turned the key, and waited in my driveway for any sign of the jogger. If I was right, I wouldn't have to wait long, as this girl was pretty consistent with her schedule. It was a simple recon mission. Follow her to her home, then go about my day. Nothing complicated. Still, I felt a bit nervous, as I'd never done anything like this before. Within a few minutes, I spotted my prey flash past in my rearview mirror as quickly as a gazelle. I hesitantly backed out of the driveway and followed. As not to call too much attention to my presence, I stayed about thirty yards behind her, as my eyes followed intently on her bouncing ass moving up and down as it caressed the fabric of her skin-tight black leggings. I imagined myself doing ungodly things to her beautiful body, and her returning the favor. As I thought about these perversions, I became aroused right there in the car, the saliva nearly dripped from my mouth as the lust in my heart bubbled over. I pressed the pedal a little further. Get that bitch. Take her, I said. As I got closer, the woman turned down another street, as did I. This area was more wooded, with nearly no homes in sight. Now, being about ten yards away... I could see that she had a pair of earbuds in, which alleviated my nerves a bit. She wouldn't even hear my car inching closer. Come on, Mark. Do it. No one's looking. Hit that cunt! My foot pressed the gas even further. It was time. Not feeling much of anything at this point, I sped towards the unknowing female. This lack of control was somehow familiar to me. Again, I was simply the onlooker. At about five feet from the woman's heels, with my heart in my throat and my throbbing passion at a zipper's ready, my victim became aware of her doom and dodged away from the bumper. In the process, her toes clipped the edge of the guardrail as she flew past it into the weeds beyond. I pulled over and got out of my car. You missed, dummy. She seemed hurt, but she was still moving. Upon closer inspection, I noticed tears in her pants, as well as a bit of blood on her ankle. I approached the injured fawn. Get her, fool! As I closed in behind her, my hands unclenched and ready to grab at her throat, like the claws of the devil himself. I did not recognize myself. I felt a branch snap underneath my shoe as fate decided to thankfully step in. The woman became startled at my presence and backed away from me quickly, scooting her bottom along the filthy ground in the process. The look on her face quickly turned from one of fear to one of anger. You nearly killed me. What the hell were you doing going that fast on a street like this? I needed to think of something. Fast. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I've been having issues with the accelerator sticking on me. Are you okay? Thankfully, Mark Rowland was in full control once again and putting on the act of his lifetime. I could nearly bring myself to tears on a simple cue. A piece of cake. What the hell does it look like? My foot's bleeding. And look at my pants. Ruined. I should call the police on you. I helped the woman up to her feet hoping and praying I could de-escalate the situation. It doesn't seem like anything's broken. Can you put weight on it? I can call an ambulance if you think it's necessary. Or I can drive you to the ER if you want to spend all day waiting to be seen. You know how backed up they always are. Is there anyone you want me to call, at least? I knew that it was just a scrape. Yeah, it seems all right. Just a cut, I think. I live right up ahead. I would call my husband, but he's at work. If he comes down here, I'm pretty sure he'll kill you. Literally. She smirked as she stretched out her ankle and attempted to lightly hop on it. 
Here, jump in and I'll drive you to your house. It's the least I can do. I wasn't sure what I was getting at. Though in control at that moment, a tiny part of me still wanted to pursue this woman. No, I'll be fine. Just do me a favor. She began to limp away from me. What's that? Get your car fixed before you actually kill someone next time. She turned her head and looked at me slyly, being somewhat of a smartass. Will do. Hey, I didn't get your name. I'm Mark. She did not respond. I'm not even sure why I made the attempt. How idiotic. With all the self-control I could muster, I got back in my car and drove away in the opposite direction. I knew that if I waited to see where she went, things weren't going to end well for her. Or me, for that matter. I returned home deep in a haze. I had completely forgotten about the errands I was supposed to run. So, obviously, as I opened the kitchen door without any items in hand, Jess was inquisitive. Where are the groceries? I just shook my head at the question and walked past her, right up the stairs. Mark, are you all right? Without providing a response, I went into the bedroom, shut the door behind me, and passed out. I was completely drained. Later that night, as everyone else was sleeping, I returned to the kitchen and sat at the table, thinking about what had almost happened with the jogger. But my mind took the memory further in a revisionist sort of way. Instead of leaving her, I instead waited and watched until the woman reached her front steps and went inside her home. I followed and did all the things I wanted to with her and to her. I masturbated as I fantasized. Little did I know, someone was watching me. Chapter 7 The Incident The next morning began as any other. I had my coffee as I sat out on the porch, enjoying a late summer's breeze as it eased me into a brand new day. Fall was quickly approaching, and I welcomed it with a smile. It had always been my favorite time of year, as well as my most productive. Sure, I knew that I had a demon or two to fight back, obviously, but such devils wouldn't deter me one bit. I could sense it. Control was returning. I could have killed that woman, but I didn't. Whatever voice I was hearing inside my head, I didn't have to listen to it. I was feeling capable, unshakable, even strong for once. That is, until Jess came up to me about some weird chalk scrawling she spotted out in the driveway. Chalk art on my nicely paved driveway was not a new thing. The neighbors had young children, and it was a weekly situation during the nice months to behold whatever new masterpieces they would come up with. Not a problem, but this was a bit different. I went around the side of my house to check it out for myself. It was a pointed message, and it was directed to me and me alone. The message read, Not in kitchen. If happens again, we'll call police. Harold. It had to be. That creepy motherfucker was watching me, though I didn't know how or why. The only window in our kitchen was at least at a shoulder height or greater. Anything from the waist down was simply not viewable. For a moment, I literally considered if this weird little bastard had a camera on us. I wouldn't put it past him. But as I investigated the possibilities further, I came upon the only answer that truly made any sense. From a very low vantage point, with me almost sitting on the slippery linoleum floor, I peered through my kitchen window and witnessed the culprit firsthand. High above, on Harold's third floor, was a visible window that he possibly could have spotted me from. Jess was watching me from the living room as I was crawling around like an animal. Um, Mark? What the hell are you doing? I'm sure it looked more than a little strange. Well, hon, it's a long story, but I'm sure you'll hear about it soon enough. 
I got up from the floor as I listened to my aging knees crackle like cereal hitting the milk. The rage in me was ignited. It was time to confront little Harold about his nightly viewing experience. Passive-aggressive bullshit was never my bag. Never will be, either. I grabbed my cell phone off of the kitchen table and went out the door into the garage. I punched at the wall-mounted button and the whine of the chain began to grow. Too noisy. I'd have to oil it soon. The door inched higher and higher as my anger grew exponentially. I didn't even wait for it to rise the entire way before I ducked underneath it, chomping at the bit. My mind was already steps ahead. I knew exactly what I'd have to do to get this meek fellow out of his house to confront me. I already knew he was watching, the absolute creepy little man that he was. A pliable target indeed, and a simple one. Throw the bone and watch him run. Pavlovian genius. I placed myself right in front of the chalk message and began to take photos of it with a smile on my face the entire time. Within moments, Harold came out of his house. Bingo. And off we went. What you think you're doing, neighbor? I refused to make eye contact yet. I just kept snapping photos. Yeah, I guess I'm taking some pretty little pictures of this harassment left at my doorstep. Some people. Very rude, if you ask me. I still wasn't looking. Pissing him off even further, I would assume. You should be ashamed of yourself doing that. What if your kids walked in and caught you? At this point, my glance shifted to the little man himself. So what is it, Harold? Do you have a thing for me or something? Spying on me? And my family? I know that you're a strange cat, but come on. A peeping Tom? And Chalk? How very manly. It's nothing but a pussy move. Passive-aggressive bullshit. The blood really began to flow. My limbs began to tingle. I thought about striking him. I should call the cops on you. What if my daughter was looking out that window? It would be exposure to a minor. What the hell's wrong with you? Harold began to grow a spine as I inched closer and noticed how stupid his haircut actually looked up close and realized how much time he spent trimming and dyeing his tiny high school beard. Fucking loser. At the end of the day, Harold, I think you're just unhappy with yourself. I think you liked what you saw. If not, then how come you waited until I finished? I was nearly nose to nose with a little prick, with my fists balled up and my ego overflowing. I could level him right there. Do it. Teach him, the worthless fuck. Go ahead, Mark. Touch me. I'll call the cops so fast. Touch you? You'd like that too much. You need help, you spineless fuck. Cops, cops, cops. Go ahead and call. How sure can you be that they'll get here quickly enough before I end you? Closed casket, I guarantee. And as for that ginger mess you're so involved with, referring to his red-headed ugly bride and children, I'm sure they'll miss you. And as far as I go, I will do whatever I want in any room of my house that I want. Harold's face became a pallid white, and his mouth opened in disbelief. Strangely, this was not a DeFeo talking, only Mr. Roland at his finest. When placed in a corner, I can more than take care of myself. Did you just threaten me? As Harold realized the true gravity of the situation, I took a moment to look around. I wasn't sure of my next move, and I wanted to cover my bases. I spotted my son and daughter first, staring at us through the living room window, mouths wide, faces aghast. I then looked across the driveway to an almost mirror image from Harold's home. His wife and children, scared to death for poor Harold's well-being. Still, the lesson needed to be taught. Just as I had accepted his fate and readied myself to take the situation onto another plane, it happened. Whoa, what the hell is going on? It was Jess. 
She looked pissed as she slammed the door behind her. Your husband here is a pervert. Do you know what he did? Harold was waving his arms around like a little girl, frustrated with a broken toy. I'm pretty sure the whole street heard it, idiot. And how dare you insinuate anything about a member of my family? But what's more concerning is the fact that you're peeking in my windows. I calmed a bit as I watched my wife stop Harold dead in his tracks. It was entertaining, to say the least. I... maybe it's best we all take a breath and try to figure this thing out. I mean, we're neighbors, for Christ's sake. It was ironic. The thought of severe bodily harm to his being did nothing to dissuade good old Harold, yet the intervention of a woman had him pissing his pants. There's nothing to figure out. You leave us alone and mind your business, plain and simple. And I'm going to give you five minutes to wash this chalk off the driveway. Jess turned around and stormed back into the house, as Harold looked down at the asphalt like an embarrassed child who had just been reprimanded. This isn't over, Harold. You just fucked up. Big time. Trust me. I blew him a kiss, then turned away. As I approached the door, I could already see Jess waiting for me in the kitchen, with her arms crossed and her head cocked to the side. Oh shit, Mark. You're in trouble now. Damn right I was. Without fail, the verbal attack commenced. I cannot just believe that actually happened. I, I just can't. I mean, I'm struggling to find the words here. What the hell were you thinking? This isn't a normal thing, and you know how quickly this is going to spread. Well, come on, explain yourself, Mark. I wasn't really sure what I could say in such a situation, but it was strange. I should have been embarrassed, but I wasn't. I barely even cared at all. I don't know what to say, hon. I really don't. I just fucked up, I guess. I mean, I still have needs... I'm a man. We haven't been together in months. Granted, it was a poor choice of setting. I agree with you on that. I spoke very dryly. I couldn't even feign emotion at the moment. Oh, so you're going to stick this on me too, huh? You are unbelievable. It's always someone else's fault with you, Mark. You don't own up to anything. A relationship is a two-way street. Things have been so crazy with you lately, having sex has not really seemed too appetizing to me. Sometimes I'm afraid to even talk to you, much less fuck you. There was much truth to her words, and, as Harold did just moments before, I shifted my gaze to the floor. I had gotten my spanking, and now I was tired. Jess stormed away and left me there all alone, in my mind and in my heart. A bit later, I made a visit to the writing room and again took a trip out of myself into the very heart of Ocean Avenue. As you can imagine, the victims had now taken on the appearance of Harold and his entire fucking family. I made a mess out of every last one of them, their ginger hair all stringy and wet from all of the blood. Unfortunately, the ringtone of my cell phone snapped me out of it. The glow of the screen attacked the pitch-black darkness of the room, ruining the mood completely. It was my agent, Daniel. I did not answer. Writing was not really on my mind at the moment. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Fume. As I mentioned earlier, sponsor Fume looks at things in a different way. Instead of completely erasing your undesirable habits, why not just remove the bad elements from them? Thanksgiving has come and gone, and themes of Christmas are all around us. But with the season of giving comes the season of overindulgence. Why not try to knock out a bad habit to round out the year, leaving more room for other things on your metaphorical plate? Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that can help you do just that. Instead of electronics, fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, fume uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, fume uses delicious flavors. I was curious myself at first and found myself pleasantly surprised by the flavors. 
Whether you enjoy the flavor of a juicy orange or the fresh taste of mint for the holiday season, Fume has you covered. Fume is fresh, delicious air at your fingertips with no harsh smells left behind on your hands, breath, and clothing. Also, Fume is made naturally. There's no electricity needed, which makes the places you can take it limitless. You get what I'm saying. Instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easier. I really enjoy how the shape and quality of the real wood piece is super light, fancy looking, and sleek. And because it's flavored vaporized air and not harmful or altering chemicals, you can enjoy your fume with you on the go. Fume mouthpieces come with an adjustable airflow dial and are designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting. Stopping is something that we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and can even be fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Keep your mouth busy and your conscience clean. Not all habits have to be bad for you. Let's create better ones together. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code HORROR to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's tryfume.com and use code HORROR to save an additional 10% off your order today. Chapter 8 Domestics. I love my wife. Always will. No matter what she's done to me in the past. Unfortunately, I've never been able to get over the transgressions. And no, I'm not working on principle here or some moralistic belief system. Everybody fucks up. It's impossible not to at some point or another. Simply put, I cannot get over these things because I'm angry that they changed me. I was a good person, a normal person. I can't say that anymore, and that stings like a bitch. The mental abuse that Jess forced upon me was a shattering experience. I've tried to put the broken pieces together on many different occasions, but I've never been able to get back to the old me. This is part of the reason why I started writing in the first place. I'm just trying to work things out, one piece at a time. No matter how demented a tale I can tell, there are pieces of me in each one of them. Jess never wanted to try counseling with me, though I think we severely needed it, so I had to take my future into my own hands. My writing is my counseling. After my little kitchen experiment, things were definitely weird for a few days. But, as usual, after one of my fuck-ups, Jess started to warm back up a bit. Then again, she was under the impression that I was still working on my novel daily, which couldn't have been further from the truth. If she knew what I was actually doing, and the rabbit hole I was willingly toying with, I would have been put away, for sure. So a secret it remained, means to an end. As far as the writing went, I was still pushing it off. I needed more, more experiences, and more blood. The DeFeos weren't done with me yet, or vice versa. Not sure, really. When Jess nonchalantly brought up the idea of a date night, I was honestly really excited. It was something we hadn't done in such a very long time. It's so easy to let life take you over. Kids, jobs, tasks. It really is too much. Living in modern times is not conducive to a healthy relationship with one's spouse. But strangely, in this day and age, I fear the attention span comes into play as well. Patience is a thing of the past. If we don't get things quickly and easily, what do we do? We bail, of course, on our wives, on our kids, even on our dreams themselves. We've been taught that it's okay to quit. Well, it's not. I have to admit, I was a little hesitant to drop the kids off at the in-law's place. 
I knew that the atmosphere around the house lately was more than a little strained, and it was beginning to show. Not so much with Jack, really, but Emily had begun to act out a bit. Jack was 13, and he knew how to handle situations a bit better than his little sister. But how could we expect anything different? She was seven, for Christ's sake, and her daddy was running around being a complete asshole. What else could she think? I had already approached Jess about the situation, and we had started to formulate a game plan on how to handle it. Emily was rambunctious, for sure, and a little rebellious, but we were sure that we would get it under control. My number one goal at that very moment, though, was to start handling my quickly dissolving marriage. Divorce was not an option. So, yeah, I figured the kids spending a night at Grammy's would do us some good. On our way to the restaurant, I couldn't help from diverting my attention to the beautiful woman who was sitting next to me. Jess had really dolled up for the occasion, and it did not go unnoticed. Short black skirt, heels, she always knew how to grab my attention. She caught me sneaking peeks and blushed, just like when we were kids. The years melted away as we drove past all of our old haunts, as well as the remnants of the crumbling steel mills that used to be all Johnstown was known for. Although we live in one of the nicer parts of town, our city as a whole is one of dilapidation, drug use, and corruption, yet overrun with ghosts of past success. Hell, it was even used as the backdrop for the Hollywood feel-good classics Slapshot and All the Right Moves. If the entertainment industry needed a true loser's atmosphere for a project, they came right here. Unfortunately, when rapping ended, Paul Newman and Tom Cruise got right the hell out of town as quickly as their planes would take them. I could only imagine their relief. All traces of industry would quickly follow suit. Now, Johnstown is simply one of those places you see on the YouTube videos. Ten places to never visit in Pennsylvania. It still amazes me that Jess and I stayed for so long, because most of our generation didn't. It's kind of a badge of honor, though, and to find success in spite of the environment in which you reside, now that is the true victory. Underdog stories are the best, aren't they? For an hour or so, as we ate, drank, and laughed our asses off, life seemed so very normal and so very easy. It wasn't hard to see that our spark was indeed still intact. If you removed all of the stressors and all the variables and were left with just her and me, you would never think that we had such issues. But that's life. It's all the extra shit that kills you. But that's okay. A few moments of perfect would have to do. That night, we walked out of Rizzo's restaurant hand in hand, assured, grounded, and a little drunk, all was well. As I held the car door for my beautiful bride, she paused for a moment and looked at me with an expression that had her on the verge of tears. Mark, I just want to thank you. I really needed this. We really needed this. I know how crazy things have been, and I know you're really stressed out right now. I just want you to know, whatever happens, I'm with you, 100%. Just... Don't shut me out, okay? Her voice cracked as she finished her sentence, and the tears began to flow. Not hers, but mine. Oh, hon, I apologize for everything. It's been such a rough time, and most of it's me. I get so caught up in my head sometimes. I set a goal, and I run at it full speed. But when I do that, everything else in my life suffers. I love you and the kids so much. I just need you to be patient with me. You guys are my life. I don't ever want to lose you. Jess smiled at me as she wiped the tears from my cheek with her hand and proceeded to quietly whisper into my ear. I have an idea. What say we stop back at home before we pick up the kids? My ear-to-ear -ear grin was the only response she would get. She nodded and provided a devious smile of her own. Back at the house, I was led up the stairs to our darkened bedroom, where Jess pushed me onto the mattress. It had been so long. 
our lovemaking was terribly overdue. I salivated as I watched her shadowy form shed every little piece of clothing she had. I quickly followed suit. We were no longer teenagers, but Jess's body was just as pleasing to me as it ever was. The firmness of her breasts caressed the insides of my naked thighs as she slowly slid on top of me and proceeded to kiss at my chest while flicking at my nipples with her dripping tongue. With my appetites firmly at the ready, I turned her onto her back and began to kiss every inch of her. I stopped at her lower stomach, where I could feel her stretch marks from the children, the only things that led on to her true motherly age. To me, it was nothing but another turn-on. I dove further, deep into her womanhood, and she groaned in ecstasy as her thighs shook uncontrollably. Within moments, our bodies were completely intertwined and pulsating together like the singular beat of one heart. We took our time with each other, relishing every moment. The thrusts were slow and meaningful. I wanted our nerve endings to build with sensation until we could handle it no more. I placed one single, gentle kiss on Jess's forehead as we both built towards climax and uttered those all-too-familiar words that most don't even know the meaning of. I love you. Yeah, right. Don't be such a pussy, Mark. Fuck her like you mean it. Make her feel it. The force and speed of my thrusting intensified, though it was no longer myself who was behind the wheel. Jess's body tightened up as her moans of pleasure turned to ones of discomfort. I worked far past her orgasm, all the while strengthening the thrusts until the power was made audible with the loud smacking of my quads against her wet bottom. Fuck, Mark, it hurts. Stop it. She tried to force me out of her, pushing at my shoulders with her palms and kicking at the backs of my legs with her heels. For some reason, a visual of two cats fucking in an alleyway entered my mind, with the female trying hard to escape the painful encounter. You're hurting me, please! Jess pleaded with me, though I did not reply. The force intensified yet again until I became a simple piston, pounding away without remorse or romance, slowing never. The sweat poured from my brow onto Jess's face and neck, probably burning her eyes in the process. Finally, as Jess's body was trying hard to curl into itself into some sort of fetal position, I reached my own orgasm with the absolute hardest thrust my body could produce. Jess's power met mine as she flailed her legs, bucked with her hips, and finally slid out from underneath my grasp. I collapsed onto the mattress, completely drained and exhausted. Crying and in pain, Jess quickly ran to the bathroom like a frightened animal and slammed the door behind her. As I lay there in disbelief while listening to Jess's cries from beyond the door, my hand brushed across the wetness of the mattress. I already knew that it was a bit of blood. Fuck. Chapter 9 Pray Thankfully, Jess would be all right. It was a bit of a challenge explaining to the children and in-laws that Mommy wasn't feeling well and had to drive herself to the emergency room, but we do what we have to. According to the doctor, there was a decent amount of bruising and some tearing, but nothing that wouldn't heal by using some antibiotic ointment and witch hazel. Speaking to Jess about it the next day was more than an embarrassing experience but also a sobering one. She said that they severely wanted to get the police involved and treat it as a rape, and I knew that she could press it if she so wished. Fortunately, she was more concerned about me and not her own well-being. I'm not blaming you, Mark, because frankly, that wasn't my husband. My husband would never do that to me. There's something going on. I want to know exactly what it is. And don't even tell me you're stressed out about your deadline. We both know that there's more. So what the fuck is it? It's bad, huh? Jess was looking me dead in the eyes. 
I had to come clean. At this point, there was no reason not to. I was in trouble, and so was everyone else in the house. Yeah, hun. It's bad. Real fucking bad. I'm losing it. I can't go in that room anymore. It's not a joke. Those windows... They've been doing something to me since they were put in. It's not like the rest of the stuff up there. It wants... Control. And won't stop until it gets exactly that. I'm... Not myself these days. I began to sob. I then fell at Jess's feet. I needed help. Are you serious? Are we literally talking ghosts here? The almighty spirits of Amityville? Please tell me you're not placing blame on those fucking windows. Jess backed away from me. Jess, please. You don't know what those things can do. They take me back there to that night. I... I'm there. I'm pulling the goddamn trigger. And you know what the scariest part is? I like it. I fucking like it. So I go back for more. It felt good to get the secret off of my chest, though I knew Jess didn't believe one single word of it. Just as my non-believing wife was readying a reply to my deepest confession, I heard a noise behind me, that of scampering footsteps piddle-paddling up the stairs. Emily, get back here. Jess stormed after her. I stayed on the floor for a while, trying to regain my composure, until I heard the pounding on Emily's bedroom door. This definitely struck me as strange, since the kids didn't have locks on their doors. I ascended the stairs and joined in the fray. Now what the fuck is going on? Is the door stuck? I was already irritated. This just put it over the top. I'm not sure why it won't open. She ran in there and just started screaming her lungs out. Jess kept trying to jiggle the knob to no avail. Emily, open the door, right now. Don't do this to Dad. We can talk about it, whatever it is. Please, just open the door. I started to pound my fists against the wood just as Jack came out of his room, wondering what the commotion was all about. Emily's screaming began to change. It stopped sounding like a little girl taking a tantrum and heightened to a wail of pain, like someone was attacking her. I became alarmed and took a more drastic approach. Out of the way, guys. Emily, back away from the door. I'm coming in. I slammed my shoulder into it, but it didn't do a thing. I took a deep breath and tried again, with a force that my body would surely pay for later on. I felt something on the other side of the door give way. I flew into the room amongst a deafening crash and what sounded like breaking glass. I ended up on top of Emily's dresser the item that was apparently blocking the door in the first place. Shards of glass from her mirror were sticking out of my forearms, and I was dripping everywhere. The pain would not yet register, but the endorphins were running full force. As I regained my bearings and got back to my feet, I realized that the situation was just as dire as I had imagined. I heard Jess gasp from behind my back. My baby P was there, all right but with her back turned to me. Her window was wide open, and she was sitting on the ledge, with her feet pounding against the aluminum siding of the house. She was no longer screaming, but instead humming something to herself. Honey, what are you doing out the window like that? Come inside. Daddy and Mommy want to talk to you. Maybe over some ice cream? How would you like that? My sole intention was to get her inside, though the mechanisms of my mind were already trying to figure out how she got that humongous armoire in front of the door. It was an impossibility for a young girl of that size. Yet, she was alone. Listen to Daddy, Emily. Everything will be okay. Just come inside. Jess was trying to get past me to reach her daughter, but I kept her at bay with my arm. I gave her a stabbing glance and shook my head. I didn't want any sudden movements. We were three floors up. Startling Emily from behind would not be a wise decision. It seemed like forever to get some sort of response, but eventually Emily stopped humming 
and the pounding ceased. She began to speak, although she did not turn from the window. Mommy, Daddy, what took you so long? Oh, I know. You were fighting again, huh? That's all you ever do anymore. Fight, fight, fight. You hate each other. And you hate me too. It was Emily, but at the same time, it wasn't. Her speech seemed different. Still that of a little girl's, but her natural cadence was off. It was almost as if she was reading from a script that was being recited to her. My heart sank into the abyss. It had control again. Oh, honey, parents fight. It's what they do. But it's not about you. Mommy and I love each other very much, and we love you, too. Things will get better, I promise. I never thought it would go this far, and from something I had started. I wish I could trust you, Daddy, but I can't. You're not my daddy anyways. I heard you say that to mommy. You lied. I guess I don't have a daddy at all. As Emily destroyed us with her words, my eyes focused for a moment on her blonde, pigtailed hair, swaying in the late summer's wind. As perfect as the sight seemed to be, I was already in motion, jutting to the window, my hand outstretched. I simply wanted to hold her in my arms, kiss her forehead, and tell her that everything was going to be okay. Regardless of the truth, she was my baby P, and I loved her, no matter what. My fingertips had just barely reached the wisp of one pigtail. As Emily disappeared from the window, skidded loudly down the side of our home, and fell onto the driveway below with a sickening thud. Just as I had experienced while in the trance, natural sound left me. A piercing whine grew and grew as I watched Jess and Jack race to the windowsill in slow motion. It was useless. She was already dead. I saw it in my mind as if I was floating from above. My baby pea's deformed limbs, contorted neck, and twisted face, in the middle of a red puddle that kept growing and expanding, until everything, everywhere, was stained. Nothing would ever be the same again. I crumpled into the corner of Emily's room, and balled up like a child in the midst of an intense fear. But the thunderstorm's danger was real. The monster under the bed existed. And Mark Rowland? He left the planet for a while. Again. He was very good at that, especially when times got tough. You've been listening to a continuation of The Eyes of Amityville by Mark Rowland. And that closes out our broadcast this evening. I know that we tend to feature some edgy content on Horror Hill, but I can't recall ending an episode on such a grisly one-two punch in the past. I'd like to again thank Danielle Hewitt for guesting in tonight's episode, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. We'll be finishing Mark's story next week, but in the meantime, if the wait is going to just kill you, you can grab a digital or physical copy of the story over on Amazon. Until next time, my friends, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshek. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, 
I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Jiry's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's dark tales, Paul J. McSorley's fear from the heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you are after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.